All right, unit two, activity two. Um, the majority of this unit is going to be about the fashion cycle. So um, a little bit of theory here, but it's important for us to know as we move on to the other activities. So uh, your desire for new fashion is one reason why fashion is constantly changing. So last unit we talked about the difference between style, design, and fashion. Um, just to review, uh, style is something that is unchangeable, um, and the length of a style that um, the length of style is in fashion has to do with the acceptance of the fashion by the consumer and the fashion cycle. So we talked about um, people buying styles based off of a certain design. And when they were buying it, it was in fashion. But something that also influences that is the fashion cycle. Um, I'm sure that you know that there have been many, many different types of variations of pant styles over the last hundred years. So in your content, there's a big long list of all the different fashion um, styles, the, the styles of pants that are in fashion. So even I do it sometimes too. So I want to show you a couple. Um, front pleated pants. And if you don't know what that is, here's a picture of style icon Katherine Hepburn. Um, in front pleated pants, you can see that they're very wide, they're high in the waist, um, and they have these iconic front pleats in them. I uh, <coughs> remember my grandmother wearing pants like this all the time. We called them grandma tear pants, um, and I still have a couple of them in my closet. Um, moving on to the exact opposite of pleated pants, we have hot pants um, from the 70s. So hot pants are basically shorts, as you can see. Um, and hot pants have come in and out of style since the 70s as well. And you can see that Madeline Smith is wearing a crop top, which um, were in fashion this summer as well. And then Moving on another 20 or so years, we have capris from the 90s. Uh, I chose to show you a sewing pattern. Um, so this would be people making their own capris. There used to be uh, this big style of embroidery on the bottom of your pants, whether they were capris or like bell bottoms or whatever, but the 90s were, were big on capris. So um, these different variations on um, pant styles had different design features as well. So let's move on to the meat and the potatoes. Um, we're going to talk about a person, this unit, um, James Laver. And he was a costume historian way, way back in the day at the turn of the century. Um, he was born in 1899, actually. And even back then, he noticed that people react to the same garment in different ways, depending on where the garment is in the fashion cycle. So let me give you a, a maxi skirt. Okay, so 10 years before it's time, people consider it indecent. Five years before it's time, maybe shameless. One year before it's time, people start warming up to it. At the peak of its popularity, obviously, people have good feelings about it. They consider it smart. And then it goes out of fashion. So once it's out of fashion for about a year, it's considered dowdy, um, like kind of lame, I guess. Ten years after it was in fashion, um, it's considered hideous. Twenty years after its time, it's considered ridiculous. And then it moves back. So 30 years, it's amusing. 50 years, it's quaint. 70 years is charming, 100 years it's romantic, and 150 years it's beautiful. So we can, it, it's easier to see this with a piece of clothing. So if we find a dress from 150 years ago, now this movie wasn't made 150 years ago, but it's based off of a time period that's about 150 years ago. We have this beautiful, <laughs> I'm going to guess beautiful, ruffled dress. Now, obviously, some aspects of it are dated, but like we can agree that she looks beautiful. So if we think about when things are ugly, they're the most ugliest about 
10 years after its time. So if you th think of things that were in fashion about 10 years ago, um, and maybe you don't remember because you guys weren't that old, but if you Google things from like the 2000s, the, uh, like early 2000s, that would be the like epitome of ugliness for fashion according to James Laver. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because he made those um, he made those ideas a long time ago, but they still seem to be accepted today. So why does fashion change? It does change. Um, and if you look at a, a bunch of these different definitions, I just pulled them from different dictionaries and such. You see these underlined words that naturally just mean they change. Adopted, well, it, you, it wasn't always around. Prevailing means like it's the most important thing at any given time. Temporary, another um, thing that means that it's not been around. So fashion is is kind of historical. You need to understand the context in which the period it was produced because the fashion is always in harmony with that period. So fashion is a symbol for social phenomenons that reflect the change in time. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at fashion houses just for a bit. Um, back in the day, industry used to decide what was fashionable and basically force change on the consumer. So if you picture Chanel, it's been around for a while. Uh, the designer for Chanel would make something, put it in their store, and then everyone would think it was fashionable. Um, if you think this is the way the fashion industry works, um, this is a very simplified version. Um, nowadays, fashion comes from the street, and then designers mimic what they're seeing um, on the street and, and interpreting it. So now, if a designer comes up with something, consumers might reject it. Um, they might feel that it's been forced on them by, like, Prada, and they don't wear it, don't buy it, and then it never is in fashion. So these kinds of things kind of blow up in designers' faces. Um, so now we consider the consumer is what changes fashion. And it's not just any consumer, it's generally um, the top echelon of people. So the people with the most money influence the beginning of fashion trends. So once they start buying, and they have money, so they will, then other groups follow suit and create trends. Um, another way that things can change is if there's a particular subculture that becomes popular. So like in the 1960s, you have like the hippie culture. So the hippies didn't necessarily have a lot of money, but if there is a giant like group of people um, wearing or doing similar things, then that might influence the development of fashion trends as well. So this is good news if you want to be a designer because it means that any creative individual can influence the development of fashion as long as they're mindful of the social climate that the period fits. So um, one thing I want you to like note is that fashion change is gradual. So when we're talking about the fashion cycle, just remember Laver, like he's talking about things coming back in 100, 150 years after its time. Um, for most, fashion changes are evolutionary, not revolutionary. So they change slowly, bit by bit, and then eventually become <coughs> something else. Um, and this allows fashion forecasters and designers to anticipate what might be in style in the future. If fashion was just completely random based off of what people wanted and there was no way to predict it, then designers would have a really hard time trying to come up with clothes for the future because they wouldn't know what people want. Um, another person that I wanted to mention is a famous French couture designer called Paul Poiret. Um, this is one of his designs and he said that all fashion ends in excess. So this means that once a fashion extreme has been reached, the pendulum be begins to swing in a new and different direction, but it swings slowly. 
So an example would be the mini skirt was extreme in the 1960s, and then it evolved into the micro mini in the 1970s with the also hot pants as well becoming popular. Um, and then once the micro mini hit, it couldn't go any shower or any shorter without showing certain things that couldn't be shown in public. So naturally, the hems began to inch downward. So um, then we start to see maxi skirts coming into play in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and we can see it happening now as well. So just a little bit of background on Paul Poiret. Um, as you can see from the picture, he's from a long time ago again. Uh, he opened his first couture salon um, in 1903. And one of the things that he did differently was he took the silhouette from articulated waistlines, like people wearing corsets with boning, and he created gowns that just kind of fell and draped over natural curves. So he didn't want women, um, his models, um, wearing corsets. He wanted um, it to flow over the natural curves of, of women's bodies, and this is probably one of the reasons why we shied away from corsets um, a little bit later on um, into the 20s and the 30s. So let's talk about fads. So a style that is short-lived is called a fad. Um, fads can, can typically be produced at a lower price point and um, flood the market for a short period of time. So they move through the fashion cycle quickly um, some stand the test of time and some don't. So I put four things down here. There's a lot more, but I thought they would be good to juxtapose. Um, all of them were considered fads at one point in time. So they thought that it was going to be a style that was short-lived. So mood rings, style, short-lived, yes or no. Um, jeans, a style that was short-lived, not so much. Leg warmers, Yes, definitely a fad. They, they come in and out, but they're only in for a short period of time. And then white t-shirts. White t-shirts were considered a fad at one point of time, and now they're considered a staple. So sometimes people think things are fads, and they just end up sticking around. So if people keep buying them, then they don't become a fad anymore. Opposite to a fad is a classic. So it's a wardrobe staple. It has staying power in the fashion cycle. It might ebb and flow at certain points, but it never fully leaves or is considered hideous. So things that are classics are trench coats, white t-shirts, little black dresses, um, Chanel jackets. So moving on to the fa actual fashion cycle, um, it may take 10 to 50 years for a style to move through the cycle and come back. Um, the reinterpretation and re resurrection of styles have become more common in the industry. So our fashion cycles are actually getting shorter. So um, generally a fashion trend is a design or style that has many collections. Um, so you might see Echoes in Chanel or Prada or Gucci <coughs> or whatever. Um, it could be a common silhouette, a color or a fabrication. Um, when things exit the cycle. I'm just going to go to this. This is when it's introduced. This is when sales start to rise. This is the peak. You can see it's on peak. This is when it's in fashion. People accept it. And then it starts to decline and it, then it gets rejected. So rejection usually happens about one year after it, the cycle. It could even be a season um, depending on what it is. And then, as you can guess, over time, it's going to come back in some way, shape, or form. So this is the last slide that I have for you. So feel free to click on the link, um, and you're going to test what you've learned about the fashion cycle in this unit so you can be successful on the activities later on.